And hello, and welcome to the Atlanta History Center's Virtual Author Talk series. I'm Virginia Prescott, host of GPB's On Second Thoughts, and your host for this series. Tonight, Laura Prescott talking about her debut novel, The Secrets We Kept. Yes. <laughs> which was an instant New York Times bestseller, a Reese Witherspoon book club pick, and it is now out in paperback. So you can purchase the book directly from Acapella Books. There is a link. <laughs> There is a link in the chat to the right of your screen, as well as a link on the Atlanta History Center's website. And as we were talking, please do submit your questions via the Q&A feature. That's at the bottom of your screen. I'm going to get to as many as I can, as many as time allows, and try and integrate them into the conversation. But please do put them in the Q&A rather than the chat, so I just have one place to look for them. And Laura Prescott, no relation, is here with us. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. So I want to hear about the origins of this book. I believe it was a Washington Post article sent to you by your father. So what grabbed you? Yes. So my dad emailed me this article it was around 2014. And what grabbed me and why he thought I'd be interested in it in the first place is that it was about Dr. Zhivago and how the CIA had used it as a tool of propaganda during the Cold War. They used it as a weapon. And one, I have a connection to Dr. Zhivago because I was named Lara after the heroine of Dr. Zhivago. And so it's always been this lifelong passion for me, both the David Lean film, the classic 1965 film adaptation, and then the book as well. So I had that going for it. So I definitely wanted to read about this article, but also I have this background working in Washington, DC, working in political campaigns. And I'm fascinated um, with the way that words can be use to change the hearts and minds of people. And so the story about how the CIA thought a book could do something like that was absolutely fascinating to me. I had to research everything I could about it right then. And the CIA re released about 100 documents and I went straight to the website and started downloading <laughs> those, those memos and reports. And from there, it just took off. So you found in those documents, a lot of this stuff was typed up by these women in the pool of typists. Their names were redacted in all of the stuff that was released by the CIA in 2014. But these were women who knew that they'd studied twice as hard as the boys to get these stellar degrees to type in the end, basically. And this is a really marked difference from the kind of roles that many, many of them, or some of them had during the war. Like what, what was that shift like before and, uh, or during and after the war? Sure, so during the war, um, people, women and men both fought and, and served in the OSS, which was this precursor to the CIA. And women like Virginia Hall and Betty McIntosh served as intelligence officers, along with Alan Dulles and Frank Wisner. And things that they did during the war are just absolutely heroic. And I can't believe this was not in any of the history books I learned growing up. But, you know, women like Virginia Hall, she, despite um, having lost her leg in a hunting accident when she was a little girl, she was leading French resistance fighters up to the front lines and she was smuggling people behind enemy lines and, and just fighting with the rest of them. And yet when the war ended, and the CIA starts up, um, many of these women were put behind a desk or in the records department or a secretarial positions. And the same men who they served alongside became their bosses and the founders of the CIA. So there was a very big difference. And I really wanted to explore, you know, what happens to these women after serving their country in such a way and then kind of having to take a back seat. So they're all in this typing pool and they they go to this regular lunch spot where they share their biting assessments, I would say, of the predominantly Ivy League men, for the most part, running the CIA at that point. Many of them were chronic harassers or worse. Um, but I suspect those those scenes at Ralph's is the joint that they go to. I think you had a lot of fun writing those scenes is my guess. I did. I did. I had a lot of fun imagining, you know, what these women who were always almost invisible presences um, in the meetings of these men talking about world politics and espionage and they knew so much about what was going on and what would they say you know behind closed doors when they were just together not only about the work that they were doing um, but you know the, the dynamics what what was it like to you know be put in this almost submissive position um, against these men and you know 
having the thought of them walking down the street, going to lunch together and having these like powwows about it was, was really fun. I don't think that they would probably call themselves feminists by any means, but there was a sort of networking. There was a way that they protected each other and supplied each other with information about how to deal with it. How did you see that? Yeah, so when I was researching women and working at the early days of the CIA, many, of yeah, they definitely wouldn't probably call themselves feminists, but at the same time, many of them knew that they could do so much more. And there was this thing called the Petticoat Panel that Alan Dulles commissioned in the 1950s to see if women were being underutilized and if they could be better utilized. And so they interviewed all these women, they interviewed all these men in the CIA. And a lot of the women said, you know, I am more qualified to, to be the, the boss of, of these men. And then the men who would say, I could never work for a woman. A woman. And so there was this, this strange dynamic. And so even though they might not have, you know, had the, the mind that they were fighting for women's rights, at the same time, they, they felt bolstered when they worked as a group and could function as a louder voice together, which was what I was playing with, with the voice of the typist being the plural we. Mm -hmm. Yes, the royal we. It's the secrets we kept. But there are a number of we's here, actually. It's, it's narrated by primarily, I think, five uh, uh, different narrators. Um, yes. like, and, but it's also like the original Dr. Zhivago novel, that it's narrated by different people. And there are also love stories here of people who are kept apart by the state in Soviet Russia and also in Eisenhower era U US. So did you go into it knowing that you were going to do that kind of parallel of the novel in some way? I definitely had the idea to mirror the love story um, within my novel of the tragic love story of Dr. Zhivago. I knew that Boris Pasternak, who wrote Dr. Zhivago, was inspired by his own life um, and used himself and his, his mistress, Olga Ivanskaya, as models for the characters of Yuri and Lara. And I wanted to delve into that real life relationship but I also wanted to mirror something that was going on in the West side of my, my story, in the CIA side of the story, and have another tragic love story, a love story that can never be, that almost speaks to Dr. Zhivago itself. Um, about the multiple voices, that wasn't planned out until I, I kept exploring the voice of the we, which was the first voice that came to me. And I kept running into these walls of, I need to show all these different perspectives so that people know how important this book was and how important this mission was. So that's when I started jumping to different perspectives to look at this one event in history. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. You set up the sense of the time, uh, the women, one of their mantras in the typing pool is fast fingers keep secrets. And they do. They know a lot more about Cold War brinksmanship than certainly the New York Times is reporting back then. And the novel begins at a time when the U.S. is definitely down in this. The Hungarian uprising has recently happened, quashed brutally by the Soviets. The U.S. is lagging behind in the space race. So America really needs a win. And their secret mission is, is a weapon, which is actually a book. So why a book? What makes that book so powerful? It was interesting. I saw a report um, by a chief intelligence officer in the CIA and said that, said that books are one of the single most important pieces of propaganda because they have the most ability to change people's hearts and minds. And if you think about it, at the time, you, know, you spend hours and hours, maybe days, weeks reading a book, putting yourself in other people's shoes and developing this connection, a, a sense of empathy for the other person, which is very powerful. It could be a life-changing force. And both the Soviets also agreed, and Stalin would also say that books were weapons, and that's why so many books were being banned and why writers being persecuted. So it's really interesting to, to delve into the thought that a book could be used as a weapon. And they didn't think this was a, a, you know, a bomb or something that could be done overnight. This was this planting of a seed. And once someone would read this book and question why it had been banned, they would then begin to question other things about their government. Mm -hmm. And the CIA had many books. Chivago was probably their most successful and famous book mission, but they also smuggled an animal farm and, and other books like that that were, were subversive content for the Soviets at the time. So well, this, this is also part of a fascinating scheme of, of the CIA's real life cultural diplomacy program or operation. It's a soft power tactic that was used during the Cold War and since actually. Yes. 
What did you What did you learn about the strategy? I thought it was I thought it's interesting to think of the long tail and and you know, receiving different messages, softer messages of propaganda. And I thought it was fascinating how much the CIA elevated art as a form of propaganda, most of the time unbeknownst to the writers and the artists themselves. Not only did they use books, but they used abstract art. You know, they, they promoted artists like Jackson Pollock. They promoted jazz musicians. And just the thought that they wanted the Soviets to think, we have the best art, we are the most free, look at these things we can do. And to them, that was almost, you know, like a knife <laughs> to the Soviet culture who upheld the, you know, letters and they were the king of letters and, and ballet and music and they did still wanted to reign free with that. And I think it's interesting to see that cultural Cold War was going on alongside the space race and maybe in the end was even more successful. Mm -hmm. There's also a terrific podcast about that right now. It's called Wind of Change. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's about a song that was written in the 80s. Um, but this is not, you know, you don't necessarily think belief in the power of great art to free the mind as a CIA value. It's not the first thing that comes to mind, certainly. Yeah, I think the CIA during the late 50s um, was a different CIA than we we know today. And even a different CIA than than what it was transformed in the early 60s. These were a group of tight-knit Ivy League men. Most of them had, had connections with each other, served in the same war together, were friends with each other. And the difference was the CIA had extremely, what we would call liberal values for the time, very different than the culture today. And many of these men turned out to be writers themselves. <laughs> and so they had in their hearts that this is something that's important. This is something that we think could change the world. This is what we're going to do to change the world. Well, there are a lot of secrets swirling around here, personal secrets and state secrets. And there are two main characters in the Russia division, the glamorous, impeccably dressed Sally Forrester, who poses as a receptionist, but she's actually a swallow, uh, and Irina Drozdova, who is not much of a typist, uh, but becomes a carrier in this story. First, what is a swallow and what is a carrier? So I was looking up different code names um, on the CIA's website right in the beginning of my research. And I saw that a swallow was what usually a woman, but it could be a man as well, but someone who used their glamour, their looks as a form of power to get secrets out of other people. And so Sal, or what they would call, a, you know, a honey trap, someone that's going to lure people in with their, their, you know, clever ways and, and then trap them to revealing their secrets. And so that's what a swallow was. And then for the carrier, a carrier could be anyone that is tasked with taking a, a letter or a package from one, one location to the next. Usually they didn't know what was in those letters or packages because it would be easier to catch them and, and pry those secrets out of them if they had known. But they would be utilized all over Washington, D.C., whether it's delivering messages internally or to, and, you know, throughout the world. And so that's what Arena was. So these women were very different from each other. Arena was given this job because she had this talent to become invisible and unnoticed, where Sally had the job because she, everywhere she went, she was the, the most looked at person in the room. There is a kind of liberation having the freedom to assume new identities that's one of the the things that we see especially through arena who she is was born in the u.s but her parents emigrated from russia or her mom emigrated from russia mm -hmm. her father taken off the ship you know uh, at the very dramatic moment but sally also has a a, a kind of you know, she speaks the way that men spoke, Irina mm -hmm. observes. She's not obsequious and polite and surprises everyone in the pool with her firm handshake. So her real power was not accepting roles men assigned to her, which of course also made her suspect. So there's a lot of play around with identity here, I think, because of course it's a spyish novel. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there is a way that identity or assuming identities becomes a part of the, the, the fabric of it. How did you think of that as a writer? I was thinking about it um, from a variety of ways. One, from the spy angle, which is what you were talking about, but also 
thinking of the identities we assume for ourselves and, and how we grow from one to the next. And I was playing around with that with the structure of the novel and the titles of each chapter has almost the role of what that person was. So for instance, Olga, she starts off as a muse. She's someone who inspires Boris Pasternak, but her role changes throughout the novel as, as she goes throughout this traumatic experience. She, she becomes a rehabilitated woman when she goes to the gulag and then she becomes the muse again. And then she becomes the emissary and the spokesperson for Boris. So you see how these people's roles are changing. And sometimes it's roles they assign themselves and sometimes roles other people assign them. And that doesn't mean that's all that they are, that they're changing from one to the next. It means that they're all things and they could be so much more than that as well. And I think that's something I'm really interested in. And of course, you know, a spy lends itself to this where these people can sink into all these other personalities and roles and what does that mean and what kind of personality wants to disappear is, is really interesting to me. If you do have questions for Lara Prescott, you can type them into the q and I will uh, add them into our conversation as much as possible. You can ask her about writing, about the book. Um, we're trying not to give away any big things for people who haven't written the book, but I know that some people have. So if you've got questions, please do ask. Um, well, so let's get to this East-West, you know, these different identities. The view of the East comes from Olva Ivanskaya, who was in real life Boris Pasternak's lover. Mm -hmm. And we meet her when she is imprisoned and, and or, or about to be imprisoned, making her way there and pregnant. So why was she imprisoned? She was imprisoned to pressure Boris Pasternak to stop writing his novel. Essentially, Boris was the most famous living writer in Soviet Russia at the time. He was primarily a poet. This was his first novel. And everyone knew that once this novel came out, this would be the most popular novel in the land. Everyone would want to read it. And the Soviets caught word of what he was writing and deemed it subversive even before it was published as he was writing. Because Boris is the type of writer that would write a page and then go recite it to a room of his friends. So quickly spread <laughs> throughout, which is very different than what I would do, but spread throughout Moscow that this is something subversive. This is going to be bad. And he also had a little bit of protection because he was so famous and also because Stalin liked his poetry and had struck him from his purge list before. But they wanted to pressure him and to pressure him, they, they took the person that at the time he was madly in love with and they, they t interrogated her in Lubyanka, trying to pressure her into giving up Boris, saying he's writing something subversive, sign her name against him. Um, and then when she refused, she was sentenced to five years in the gulag and she never gave up Boris. She, she continually denied that he was doing anything wrong and she paid for it. And Boris, where he never was imprisoned for this, Olga was not once, but twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the abject cruelty of imprisoning her to get to, to punish Pasternak instead of the writer himself. And this is all true. You know, Olga <laughs> has written her own book about her life uh, and others have written about the Dr. Zhivago affair, but not mm -hmm. with all of the, the, the typists, the pool and all of the other characters who are in there. So one of the things like the conditions at the prison camp where she is sent in Siberia, just absolutely mortifying. And what did you find in your research about what prisoners did go through in the, in the Siberian camps? Oh my gosh. So, I mean, it started her torture basically starts as soon as she's taken and she's taken to these interrogation rooms in Lubyanka in Moscow before she's even taken to the labor camps. And she actually has a miscarriage due to the trauma of the constant interrogations and dragging her from one place to the next, not knowing, is she going to be killed? Is she going to be punished? Then, you know, she's taken about 500 miles away from everything she's known and love and put into a, a labor camp where she's subjected to hard labor every single day and living in these barracks, which are just cold in the winter and hot in the summer and smelly and uncleanly. And she has to just get by with whatever means she can do it. And one of the things she would do is just recite Boris's poetry in her head while she was, you know, working in the fields. And fortunately for her, she only had to serve three years of her sentence because Stalin dies in 1953. And as a result, 
many political prisoners were released from these camps and she was one of them. Um, but she did spend three years um, in the beginning and then she later served um, another sentence after Boris died. What a cost. Um, so you are weaving together a true story of real life espionage and, and the fictional story as well. So you had to invent dialogue based on relationships like between uh, Boris Pasternak and Olga. How did you ground that in reality as a writer? So I had so many different timelines going on in my head because I wanted to make sure I was sticking to the historical facts of what happened. But as I am writing fiction, the fun of it was imagining you know, what did Boris and Olga say, you know, after he won the Nobel Prize, things that weren't printed in letters or autobiographies. And for me, it was really important to capture the essence of these people before I could imagine what they might say to each other. Um, whereas on the, the Western side with my CIA officers who are all fiction, mostly fiction, I could just, you know, think of their personalities and invent dialogue. But I was always going back and weaving in quotes and things that they had said in history and that were noted in letters or their books that they've written about the circumstances and then weaving in fiction with it and setting the scene, but making sure I hit those key points of history of, of what was happening. So the question here, Christy Mack, how close to reality was the typing pool and relationships depicted? A lesbian relationship, for example. I'm not going to ask the last part of that because it's a real spoiler. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, no big spoilers. But um, with the typing pool, I did a lot of research of what it was like to work in the early days of the CIA as a woman. And one of the things that I was uncovering is I wanted to know what else was going on in Washington, D.C. at the time. And I stumbled on the lavender scare, which isn't something I had ever heard of. I, I knew that people were always persecuted um, for, for their sexuality um, since, you know, since forever in Washington, but I never heard of the term lavender scare, which came right after the red scare, which everyone knows about. We all learn about the red scare and, you know, seeking out communists within the government faction, but this was uh, uh, actual um, process in the U.S. government, especially starting in the 50s, where thousands of people were fired for their sexuality and without cause um, or without any, you know, form of repercussions. And sometimes these people's names were printed in the newspaper and many lives were destroyed as, as, as a fact um, of what happened after that. And so I, I thought about what would it be like to be one of those thousands of people in the CIA, the State Department, and other branches of the government who were fired. And so I also was tying it to another tragic love story to mirror Dr. Zhivago, but this time it was between two women. And I thought, what would it be like to be these women in love and not knowing if they could ever, you know, be together? In the Lavender Scare, were there accounts of people who had been in these kind of relationships? Oh, absolutely. There's a tremendous, well, there's a book called The Lavender Scare, and there's also a documentary that was made after the book. And it's absolutely um, many different first person accounts of these people who suffered and who were interrogated by, by their own employers and fired and the, what they faced after that happened. So this was, this was rampant abuse. And somebody else asked, an anonymous person asked, how were you able to evoke the ambiance of DC and Foggy Bottom in the late 50s so effectively? There were some really great websites that I stumbled on. Well, first of all, I, I read so many books. I watched so many documentaries, but there is a really great website about old DC and it has links to all these footages of what it was like to be on the streetcar just going around watching Northwest DC, Georgetown, Foggy Bottom, what, is, what does it look like? And that website also documented, like, where would you go if you were going out for a fancy meal? Here's pictures of what it looked like. And it's just someone's passion project that they collected all of these archival photographs and, and everything. And so I loved looking for those things, um, either online or talking to librarians or going through archival footage myself. It's absolutely essential, I think, if you're writing historical fiction to capture that time because it is different. You know, Washington DC in the 50s is different than New York City in the 50s. And to capture, you know, what the dress was like or what what the culture was like was really pleasurable for me or what the fashion was like was really pleasurable for me. 
Yeah, the fashion comes across, I think, very well. And it's part of it. You know, it's a big part of the story, like people's identities, what they're presenting to the world, and also the party life. It was a really, really rich party life, it sounds like, yes. among the early CIA. Yes, I. so that, the scene of Sally on the yacht in the beginning of the novel, where you first meet Sally, that was really inspired from this photograph I saw of uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. and a group of powerful men, some in the CIA, some in the State Department, partying on a yacht in the Potomac. And I, I was so fascinated by this party culture. When I spoke to a spy or early spy expert that I was introduced to, she said, yes, so much business went on in these parties, on the yachts, in people's houses. That's where the real business took place. So, you know, you know, they'd be 10 martinis in and they would be deciding what the next mission or, you know, what would be printed in the Washington Post. It's absolutely ridiculous to think about it, but it's, it's very true. But there is this furtive, the plot follows this furtive handoffs in Berlin, Brussels, Rome, D.C. And there are these landmarks in D.C. that you use for the handoffs of uh, confessional at St. Patrick's, I think, and then the Bishop's Gardens at the Bishop's National. Garden, yep. <laughs> that, did, I, were those real? Did you... So for the for the actual Zhivago notion, I do not, there is no record of where these handoffs occurred, but I did research of where typical handoffs were, and the Bishop's Garden was one of them, and the National Cathedral has this beautiful garden next to it, and that was a CIA handoff, as was Rock Creek Park, as was the Mayflower Hotel, which features in my novel, and the Mayflower um, is a famous spy site throughout the decades of the CIA. And it was in the in the 50s and 60s, a place where CI officers had practiced the art of the handoff. So they were training how to slip an envelope to someone else, which I have a scene in my novel depicting that very thing. But um, I will say some of these places I had, because I lived in DC for about 10 years, I knew myself, but I had no idea the secret history uh, behind them before I started studying up on what was it like to, to, to live in CIA. Georgetown and, and see what these places were really like. Did you just say Dr. Zivago? Did I? <laughs> have I, well, I, was, I was just wondering, like, have I been saying it wrong? No, I time? must have mumbled my words. <laughs> Zivago. <laughs> I thought I should have asked you about pronouncing the most basic thing <laughs> at the beginning of this conversation. And the, but this is the book that Boris Pasternak is determined to get out to the public. And it's been well documented that when he handed it off to the, the manuscript to an Italian go-between, he said, you are hereby invited to my execution. Yes. This is so big, you know, a death warrant in effect for, for, for everyone, including Olga and her family. And we get a glimpse of how just grossly distorted human relationships become when loyalty to the state is compelled uh, by, by such brutality. I, I, what was it like to explore that as a writer, especially knowing that so many writers were the subjects of these purges? It was fascinating. I think I keep comparing it to today and, and you know, living in the United States, many people don't realize that some of this is still going on throughout the world. It's going on in countries like China and Saudi Arabia where writers are still being imprisoned um, and not allowed to publish. But, you know, during those times, this was a very common occurrence that Stalin would, would censor, shit, censor its writers to such an extent that Boris Pasternak's, many of his own peers, never lived past the 1930s. And he was almost seen as a, a lucky person that he got out of it. And I think there was a lot of guilt that he, he felt for being a survivor, where many of his neighbors, his peers, um, were killed, sentenced to the labor camps, or never heard of again. And it's interesting to see that Boris, despite all of this, kept going and knew that this could be a death sentence, as he said, when he handed off his manuscript. But he had the courage to say that, you know, so be it. I, this is why I write and this is what's going to happen. And I think about that a lot of, you know, our, how can I even identify with that? I would probably be like, no, like, uh, me and my family are going somewhere else. It's fine. But, you know, for him, this was a life or death issue to, to get his words out into the world. It is an irony that 
60 plus years later, Russia is now using social media to sow political division here in the U.S., planting the seeds, as uh, you spoke of earlier about the book. So what is that like for you, who spent so much time on Cold War history to watch this strategy play out? I think I, when I started this novel, um, none of this was in the news. It was pre-election. Um, and when it started coming about, I couldn't even believe that this was still happening. I, 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 of course, assumed that, you know, there was the Cold War hadn't really ended and, and lots of things were still going on behind the scenes. But to see it play out on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook, where a, a news story could go viral within seconds, whereas, you know, before they would take a book and hope that people would read it and years later, maybe something their minds would be changed. But now you have a fake news story that everyone could believe within seconds. And it's so powerful and so frightening that I, it felt like almost to speak to how history has affected today and history always repeats itself is one of the reasons why I write historical fiction, because I think examining the roots of something, you can understand the present moment better. Um, but yeah, I certainly wouldn't have predicted that and that it's still going on today. It's, it's, it's not just Russia, but other countries as well. I think I read somewhere that uh, there was some book pitch event that you went to and an and agent or a publisher said, nobody cares about Russia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, de that definitely did happen. <laughs> it was an agent. And so I went to an MFA program and a few agents came by the MFA program recruiting. And she said, no one's interested in Russia anymore. It's played out. <laughs> and this is, you know, before, um, you know, every news story was about Russia. So I think for any writers out there, you can never predict, you know, just keep writing what you're writing. You can't predict if it's going to be in the news or be out of play. It's, it just takes years to write. You can't go with any trends or listen to anyone's bad advice. <laughs> just write what's in your heart. Well, I wonder for you, like doing this research about Olga, who inspired the character of Lara, who you were named for. I mean, I'm not trying to get all woo-woo, but is there any way that you felt, you know, I'm fated to do this. This is, this, is, this is my story to write. I think I feel a very strong connection um, with, with Dr. Zhivago, and I always have. I think my mom would say I was fated to write it. I don't know if I would go that far, <laughs> but it is interesting to find some, that something that embodies all of these different passions in my life, whether it's words, writing, politics, and also Zhivago come together in one, one project. And it's something that when you're writing something that takes so many years to write, you really have to be passionate and almost obsessed with it. And I think it really, I really was, and it was hard to kind of put that away once you're finished writing it. Here's a question. Were you inspired to use so many different narrators because of going into the writing program? Did they encourage you to play around with point of view? They, I wouldn't say they encourage it directly, but, and I'm trying to think of who gave me this amazing advice. One of my professors definitely said, you know, while you're doing revision, think about, can this be written another way? Does it have to be in this perspective and why? You know, why are you telling it from this way versus another? And sometimes you can't really get into the story until you explore all these different angles. And for me, you know, whether I was choosing first person or third person, it was all a matter of trial and error until I found what I thought embodied the voice. And so I thought that was really good advice and, and something I, I still do. If I'm stuck, I'm like, well, am I really coming at this from the right way? Should I be thinking of it? from a different angle, a different perspective. And that always helps. Flo wants to know, how much time did you spend researching the book versus writing? Wow, I think probably even, I would say half and half. I, I did a lot of research before I even started writing. You know, as soon as I read this 2014 article, I began my research. And then it was almost a year later in 2015 that I started writing the novel. So I had this, you know, bulk of research behind me when I began the novel, and then the research just continued throughout the writing process. I would write into a hole and I'd think, okay, what, 
I'm thinking that this character is going to, you know, want to go to Italy or going to be assigned to go to Italy. And then I'd have to do all this research about Milan and, mm -hmm. and what it was like to, to be at this fancy part publishing party. And so I would write myself into more research, but I think I always used research as almost a procrastination <laughs> method when it got, and I had to set it aside at one point and say, I don't really need to know, um, you know, what type of shoelaces they were wearing. I think this is like overkill, but it's make, it fuels you. Like even if it's, it never gets in the novel, so much of the research doesn't end up in the novel. It just makes you more interested in it and you keep wanting to know more. And I think that fuels creativity for sure. I want to dig into your story a little because you were talking about, you know, right, going through the process of writing. You quit your job in DC working as a political operative, as you said, writing a lot of communication, uh, propaganda, I think is what you yes, said. I call it propaganda. <laughs> Studied writing at UT and, and then came out of the gate with this as your first book. There was a bidding war for it. You got lots of money for it. Instant New York Times bestseller, TV deal, movie deal in the works. That That is like every aspiring novelist's dream. So, so what is it like to go through that experience? It's strange. <laughs> I think when you're writing a novel, especially your first novel, you have no hopes that it will ever be read by a single person. Um, I didn't think it would be published. I would tell my family not to talk to me about it. Well, it was at, when it went out to the agent because I was, I said, it's going to take months. I probably will just be rejected. So please don't mention it. And so when it happened, when there was this, you know, interest in the novel and an auction and it just felt like, it was like a, a, a train going out of control because I couldn't even put my feet on the ground for months and months after, after it was sold. And then I had to get back to work on the novel. And that's where I feel the most comfortable, you know, writing in my, you know, with my computer and some coffee and being the author is a totally different experience, which is a learning experience for any debut author, I think, and being in the public eye and, and doing interviews and, and things like that. It's, 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 it's almost a different job. So, you know, I think while I, it's, it's absolutely thrilling and I still can't even, you know, fathom all the things that have happened, the positive things that happened to the book, I still feel most comfortable when I'm just back at the desk and, and, you know, writing the next novel. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a weird mixed bag of emotions, but definitely positive. I mean, all of this has made me be able to write the next novel and the next novel after that. So <laughs> that's all I can hope for. But that kind of success for a lot of people can also, you know, the expectations that come with it, uh, jealousy, pressure. Mm -hmm. um, how are you managing that? I think it's important to, and someone gave me this advice right when it happened and said, you know, keep your friends and family close because they're going to tell you like it is. They're going to treat you like you, they've always treated you. And they're the people that are going to be there for you during the ups and the downs. Cause there's a lot of ups and downs during the publishing process. And so I think for me, I found even more, I feel like even closer to those people because I relied on them so much over this last year and they really got me through all of this, kind of noise. And I think you really have to kind of isolate yourself. And I think there's different times where I, I, I think, oh, I understand why some people write under a pen name and, you know, you know, go off to the woods in New England and never just keep writing their books anonymously. <laughs> because, because it is, it is, it's hard to, to, to stay away from the noise. I even had to, I go off social media, I block it from my computer when I'm writing. Um, I had other people posting about my events on social media just because I just couldn't it, it just was too much to think about. So yeah, there's pressure, but you have to just stay true to yourself and you, you, there's nothing else you can do. Well, you know, now people want to know the topic of your next novel. <laughs> well, I will say, I think it's going to be set in the 1930s in uh, Pittsburgh, which is where I'm from. So it's set in the, during the, the depression. And I think one of the main characters is going to be working for the Federal Writers Project, which was a New Deal program that sponsored or paid writers to collect stories uh, during the Great Depression. And I'm, I'm very fascinated with that concept as well as that time period. So we'll see, or maybe next year will be something different, but that's what I've been working on. That's where I've made some headway on. 
You're not going to go all past your neck on us and just read off a page right now. No, no, no. I, I think he, he had a, he had the, the ego for that. I, 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 I keep it hidden until the it's done. And then I show it to my husband first. But I have to ask, since it is being optioned for film and television, I think, uh, The Secrets We Kept, um, casting fantasies for Irina, Sally, Olga, anything? Yeah, so it is, I think television is, is where they're moving for like a limited series kind of thing. But, and where I don't have any say, and who, who's casted, I've had a few people in mind. I, now I always forget who I, who is in the lead, but I think like Shorshi Ronan for um, Arena would be fantastic. <laughs> and I could see, yeah, I could see her and then someone pretty, you know, very glamorous for Sally. Um, who was I thinking? Now I can't even remember, but I was thinking Kirsten Dunst would be really good for Sally, um, but I'm not sure. She's got she's got that kind of swagger, I think. Yeah. And Michelle Williams, I think, would be really good for Olga, just because I, I feel like she can play that that tough role really well, and, and someone who's been through such tragic circumstances, I think she could really tap into that. But I will say I love when there's unknowns cast. I think that I was watching Normal People, the Sally Rooney adaptation, and I loved all of the actors that I had never heard of before, and they were new to me because I feel like they really could embody the characters without extra baggage. <laughs> That's very writerly in some kind of way, I think. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time, Laura Prescott. What a pleasure speaking with you. And thank you to everybody who asked questions. And of course, you can buy the book. Oh, you should show the soft cover. <laughs> you should show the soft cover. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Thanks, everybody. And thank you for everybody for Zooming in with us tonight. Be sure to join us next Monday, July 14th, for Lisa Napoli. Her new book is Up All Night. It is about Ted Turner's absolute moonshot launch of CAN, and it is a wildly entertaining book, I have to tell you. I hope you join us for that. And on Wednesday, July 15th, the fabulous novelist Jessica Handler is going to be talking with Heather Lend about her book of Bears and Ballots. You can find a full schedule and Zoom links at atlantahistorycenter.com. Good night, everybody. Thanks for being here. And thank you again, Laura. Thanks, guys. Take care.